We're going to talk about standards. Yes. And I'm looking out there. Some of you kind of look like my daughter did. It's OK. She was, Paigey was about three or four years old. She was in ESY. And that her speech teacher took that picture of it and sent it to us. And I, and I responded back, it's a well, pretty engaging instruction there, huh? <laughs> but there it is. So you don't look like that quite yet. All right, so a little bit of background. There's the State Education Department building. We saw Eric was here in the fall, Eric Sweet, to give you kind of an overview of the standards. And that was really nice of them to send him out. Uh, but they really don't have a ton of capacity when it comes to implementation which really isn't necessarily their role as a regulatory body. Their job is to put regulations in place and put the stuff out there for then us to implement. So there's still information up there on Engage New York about the Common Core, and that all that stuff still lives up there. But they've also done a nice job of getting the information out around the next generation science or next generation ELA and math standards. I think it's important right now because this is one of those times when, and I remember this, I remember as a high school math teacher sitting in faculty meetings or sitting in professional development and somebody saying, okay, going off and giving an example about social studies and me sitting in the back all crabby like, well, this doesn't apply to math. But, you know, what do you do? It's always social studies or it's always ELA. So I'm just going to put that right out there right now. We, we will have some math and ELA examples and the new next gen standards are math and ELA. But the work that you're doing around digging into standards and understanding standards at a deeper level, that work is never wasted because we all have standards in our different disciplines and our different content areas. And that work is always important. And I, as a, as a former school principal and as a teacher, I don't think you can do enough in terms of digging into standards. All right. So just really quick on the timeline for these next gen science or math and ELA standards. Uh, the regents adopted them in 2017. Right now we're in this raise awareness phase where we're talking about standards, we're digging into them, we're looking at resources, things like that. That's going to go through the beginning of spring. Then phase two, the department is calling building capacity. And from our perspective as a region, this is where we start to get into standards-based curriculum development. So we've raised awareness about the standards. Then in the spring, we're hoping to move into working on that curriculum region-wide in a collaborative way. And then full implementation is September of 2020 because you need that new standards-based curriculum in place because the assessments for 3 through 8, ELA, and math will be aligned to the new standards in spring of 2021. Did anybody pick up? Here's the trivia question. We'll see. I'm going to check for understanding here for a second. Does anybody remember how many BOCES there are in the state? Remember what I said? 37, right. It's a prime number. That's how I remember it. So a couple of the BOCES district superintendents got together. My former boss from Monroe 1 BOCES and Anita Murphy, who's the district superintendent here at Cap Region, really spearheaded this effort to bring several, invite all the BOCES, but bring those who are interested together to help support the rollout of these new standards. And that's really important because in a lot of cases, their BOCES might be off doing their own thing and everybody's doing the same thing, which doesn't make a ton of sense. And I would argue that ELA, third grade ELA at Middleburg is probably not a whole lot different than third grade ELA in Cicero, North Syracuse or in Cortland. Uh, there's a lot of work that can be shared and done that doesn't have to be duplicated. So these folks got, they got together, they invited the BOCES. So far we have 18 BOCES and one of the big five Syracuse is in. So those stars show you which BOCES are participating. And so you know, we are, we've met a couple of times and we're basically meeting with the, the, leaders, the instructional and curriculum leadership from those different BOCES. And the plan is, at our next meeting, is to really start to dig into who has what kind of expertise around the state and what can you share so that we can collect materials, resources, and professional development that all BOCES and participating districts can use. So that it isn't, if you, if you as a, a, de, a department chair or a teacher leader 
or a grade level chair wanted to do some work around deconstructing standards with your with the teachers you work with there would be resources and professional development to do that so that you didn't have to make it up on your own so as part of this work that we did as these BOCES getting together we a lot of the folks around the table had participated in the standards rollout in 2011 and participated in network team training. Did anybody here go to that training, the network team training? A couple folks did. Um, it basically was the, the state contracted with the $750 million of race to the top money to provide professional development to people that BOCES and big districts would send, and then those people were supposed to go back out and turnkey that training. So imagine probably this many people in a hotel ballroom with no windows doing PD for eight hours a day, five days at a time. So spending weeks in Albany out on Wolf Road. A lot of the information in the professional development was good. It was high quality. The problem was it didn't always make it out to districts. Depending on the capacity of the folks from the local BOCES that went, they may or may not have had the ability or the, the capacity to turn key that information around. So. If you look down through that list, this was just a list that we generated as a group of folks who participated in that rollout in 2011. And you can see down through there that, that sense of feeling rushed. People really felt that last time. And I think that was a combination of things. I think people might have waited to get started on implementing the standards, but I also think that all of the other things going on at the same time contributed to that sort of initiative overload. Right, because remember, we were changing APPR, we were aligning it to student assessment, um, and we were data-driven instruction. All these things happening at once that really didn't let us have that deep focus on the changes to the standards. And there were big changes from where we were in, I think it was the 19, might have been the early 2000s standards update, and then to the 2011 with Common Core. It was a big change. But the one thing that I really want to call your attention to is down at the bottom, this idea of trying to teacher-proof things versus trusting teachers to use their knowledge and skills to do their jobs. And I think, and I would argue, that in 2011, on that continuum, I'll say we as a system, we erred on the side of trying to teacher-proof things. So with the modules and things like that, where it was, you know, we don't trust teachers to actually do this, so here's the curriculum, follow the script. And in some places, that didn't work so badly. It, it, some places it worked. In most places, it did not. So that's one end of that continuum. The other end is everybody's an independent contractor doing their own thing. When, when I was teaching, we used to call that hide and teach. Go do your own thing, independent contractor. So there's a balance there, right? In between there, I err on this, more on the side of trusting teachers to use their knowledge and skills to do their jobs and make instructional decisions for what's best for the kids sitting in front of them. So hopefully, we continue to help you build your knowledge and skills to continue to do that work. A couple of definitions, um, because this is something that as we started to get into this work, we found that we didn't have a lot of consistency around what we thought stuff meant. And this is, this is hard because a lot of these terms have been in the education jargon forever and have different meanings depending on who's talking about them. So here's one for standards. I won't read it to you. I'll give you a second to read it. Makes sense, right? Kind of feel good? Okay. Curriculum. Miss, a lot of times folks miss the difference between standards and curriculum. What do you see is the big difference there between standards and curriculum? Yeah, the learning objectives, right? which some people refer to as teaching points. So you may have heard that terminology. That's a term that we're going to try to use throughout our model, which is really getting down to that objective level of what do the students need to learn to be able to demonstrate that they've met the standards. I trailed off there a little bit. And then skills, knowledge, and understandings. These three, this is where we're going to spend a lot of the work after we're done in here, is thinking about 
what do students need to know, understand, and be able to do to show that they have met a standard? And you might be thinking to yourself, self, I get this. I do this all the time. This is task analysis. I think about what my students need to understand to be able to do, and then that's how I plan my instruction. Great. Not everybody thinks that way, first of all. And I'm here to tell you, I did some of this work. I, I tried it, right? That's what you should do as a good teacher. You should try the stuff before you make the kids do it. So I tried it, and it was way harder than I thought. And I used, I used a couple of ELA examples, some math examples, and... It, those, those disciplines are in my wheelhouse, and I struggled with it a little bit. Okay, so let's take a, just an example. And again, try not to tune out, but it is, it is an ELA example. Um, but I, wanted, I picked evidence because this idea of evidence and using evidence, that transcends the disciplines. Right? Everybody's asking kids to, to cite evidence and justify their thinking. Okay? So there's an example of a standard in eighth grade. All right. If we take it down to the next level, around teaching points. So curriculum, I kind of skipped over that quick. But the curriculum, and this again was kind of this conversation that we had about how did these two, which comes first, the curriculum of standards? Well, the standards come first, but the curriculum sort of include or does include the teaching points. So if we take this standard and look at what might be examples of teaching points, those are some examples that fit with that standard. Now notice, we are, we are in, this is part of curriculum, but yet it doesn't say, analyze the great Gatsby. It doesn't say, you know, analyze, evaluate evidence from a Wordsworth poem. It doesn't do that. This is just, these are the teaching points. And then the next step for this is the teacher taking those teaching points and then making the decision, what's the content that I can use for these students that's going to get them to do that. And that's, a, that's a, a careful distinction that I think sometimes we gloss over. And we like to go right to content, because that's the stuff that we know, and that's the stuff that we enjoy. But this is a really important part of this process that I feel like sometimes gets glossed over. So like I mentioned, the big areas that we're going to focus on today are around these skills, knowledge, and reasoning, or understanding. And this is the tool that we're going to use. And it's pretty simple. Some of you, I'm sure many of you, most of you are familiar with these three concepts. But trust me when I say it's harder than you think. And it will absolutely spark some discussions in your groups when you start to argue about, well, is that really knowledge or is that a skill? And to what extent is this piece an understanding? And can I have that understanding without having this knowledge? And Believe me, it's, it's good conversation. And that's why I said at the beginning that I don't feel like any of this time is wasted. I think this is good time spent on thinking deeply about what we want our students to know, understand, and be able to do. That's where we're headed. But I also want to give you the bigger picture overview of this curriculum design model. So if you take a look, I've got the, the phases of where we're headed on the left there. And in that first part is the next generation standards, or any standards, I would argue. And this is where we are today. So we're digging deeply into standards. We're unpacking them, unwrapping them, deconstructing them. I'll make some kind of joke about that later. But uh, digging into the standards, learning about the standards. From there, you move into, once you have a deep understanding of standards, then you can translate those into a standards-based curriculum, which involves prioritizing standards and then working down to the level of those teaching points. From there, you can get to lesson plans, assessments. And what I like about this model, which isn't always the case for all curriculum design models, is that at the beginning of it, we're thinking about what happens when kids don't learn it. So we're thinking about those multi-tiered systems of support. We're thinking about response to intervention at the beginning with this goal of having a consistent and coherent core instructional program that makes sense vertically and that people are able to follow consistently horizontally. The other part of this that's really important, and I, I don't want to gloss over this, is that also at the beginning of this process and thinking about this model, we're thinking about those two really important special populations that we have. English language learners, which continue to increase in numbers in all of our districts, and students with disabilities, which is close to my heart. 
Both of my daughters are deaf, and they're on two different ends of the spectrum. Our older daughter, our 16-year-old, is taking AP classes, and our younger one, our 12-year-old, is alternate assessment. In that group of kids, she's in a BOCES uh, 12-1-4 class. So I'm seeing that play out for my own children on both ends of that spectrum. So I think it's really important that we think about kids on those different, of those different populations at the beginning of this process and throughout. I started to make this case at the beginning of why standards are important, and I want to I want to drive that point home now, and I I hope you'll indulge me a little bit. So. I wanted to come up with an example that we could all relate to because like I mentioned at the beginning, if we stick with just one particular discipline or a couple of content areas, there's a whole big chunk of the room that, that it feels like that that doesn't apply to them. So, okay, so there's my children, right? Redheads, yep, okay. And uh, yep, there it is. So there's a house, it's not my house, but that's a house. There's the basement of that house. There's my children in the basement. I don't want them living there. <laughs> so I'm not, if your children are currently living in your basement, I'm not judging you. I'm being a little judgmental, but I'm not judging you. So from my perspective, there are standards. Standards are important to meet so that my children will be not only college and career ready, but out of the basement ready. That, that's what I'm going for here. So it's trying to think of some kind of standard that related to out of the basement readiness. And one of the ones that's been front and center for our family recently is driving, because we have a 16 year old. So there we, we, we got our permit. That was us get, that was Emma getting her permit right there. Good times. And um, I thought, okay, there must be standards associated with driving. So these are tough to read, but these are on from right off the DMV website. And they read like standards. Steering, steer smoothly, whether you are driving straight ahead, turning, or backing up. Okay, so those are standards and content standards, basically. So I picked out communication. I thought that would be a really fun example to take a look at when it comes to standards and to deconstruct or unpack or whatever. When you think about standards, and this is part of the prioritizing process that we'll start probably after today before we come back together in March, there are things that are essential to know. And with any content area, any standard, there are certain things that are essential. So I, when I thought about what's essential to know when it comes to communication and driving, well, that you have to do it. it. It's necessary to communicate with other drivers and pedestrians when you're driving for safety. Now, when you move beyond essential to know, there's things that are nice to know, or I'm sorry, things that are important to know. So it's important to know that there are different ways to communicate depending on the situation or whatever. So that's important to know. Now, then it's nice to know that sometimes when people blink their lights at you, it means there's cops at. Right? That's nice to know, but not necessarily essential. So taking this theme of communication and driving a little bit further, there's the standard. I'll let you read that. Okay. So let's break it up. This is the tool that we're going to use, and this is, this is my joke about this. Sometimes we say deconstructing, sometimes we say unwrapping, to holiday. Um, yeah, that was a joke. Tough crowd. I'll be here all week. Try to veal. Or unpacking standards. We're kind of using unpacking. I mean, there was, there's some, it depends who you talk to because some people are like, well, you know, in, in science we didn't like deconstructing or in here we didn't like this. And so, I don't know, deconstruct, unpack, unwrap, whatever you like. I was talking about it yesterday and somebody's like, who cares? Just call it, learn more about them. I'm like, okay, that works. So here we go. There's some knowledge things associated with communicating while driving. Got to know where the horn is. Got to know where the directional thing is or the signal. Got to know the hand signals. Anybody know those anymore? Right. Left, right, stop. Okay, good. Take the next level. But there's skills. So those are, those are things you need to know. Now here's the skills. Got to know how to operate the horn. And there are different intensities and durations. 
that you can use the horn. You need to know how to operate the signal. And that's not an intuitive thing. That was really funny to me when we were, Emma was first learning how to drive. She's like, what do I do with this thing? You know, like, they, they need instruction. It's something you have to practice. And then the hand signals. And then the understandings. The second one, uh, the directional signal is a way to communicate where you want to go. Now, I put even though because in my family, I often receive growth producing feedback on my... On my... Uh, failure to use the turn signal and my response is it's nobody's business where I'm going they don't appreciate it okay so that is not a way to communicate <laughs> sorry couldn't resist uh, when other things are not appropriate so there we are so that's how we've unpacked those standards and like I said I wanted to have it's kind of funny and it's sort of I don't know I wanted an example that sort of transcended the, the content areas and the disciplines. And we got our road test, we got our license, which is great. We've only had one fender bender since uh, September. I'm sure she's thrilled I'm sharing that. But if you look, now this is interesting, because remember, there's some response to intervention going on in our house related to driving, because while she did pass, she uh, did not look when she was leaving the curb at one point, and she could not parallel park to the point where the examiner was just like, just forget it. <laughs> Like, all right, so, but you can, you can pass, but maybe you didn't meet every single standard to the highest level. So we got multi-tiered systems of support for paying attention and parallel parking. So this is the form that you're going to use. You have a copy of it in front of you. Your facilitators also will have extra copies that you'll use when you get together in your smaller groups. And I wanted to show you a couple of examples from content areas. So I know it's a ton of text up there and I apologize for that, but this is, uh, this is a math example from fifth grade. And you can see how quickly it gets complicated and gets deep. There's a lot there. And then one for ELA, we're going to go a little bit deeper on. So this one, also from fifth grade, ELA, uh, there's two parts of it. There's the reading for information part and the reading literature part. So the one in red refers to the reading for inform reading informational text or nonfiction. Take a look at that one. This is one I, I did myself, and I kind of, I struggled with this, to really to break down and analyze, particularly the skill. So this is work that you're going to do after we're done in here, and then after lunch. And depending on time, we might run out of time, but it would be great if we could also, it was planned for when we had the, the full day, and now that we're shortened a little bit, this was a piece that we chopped off the end, but you might be able to get to it. And I think this is really where it, it starts to hit home for how complex this work becomes. So if you think about the one in red, so informational text, and what would be some... Act, and I, I hesitate to use the word activities, but tasks, assessments, activities, whatever, uh, instruction that is designed that should the students complete it would show that they have mastered the standard or met the standard. So here's three that I made up related to this standard. And I'll give you a second to read them. I'm in your way. What I'd like you to do is talk with somebody sitting next to you. Which, which one, which two, do all of them, which ones or one 
actually align with that standard, do you think? Have that conversation. Go ahead. So let's, I'm curious, uh, raise your hand if you think number one meets the standard. Anybody? How about number two? Okay. Number three? Couple? So when I designed it, I aimed for just number two meeting the standard. And one and three are probably things that I, act, did, I actually did as a fifth grade teacher, which are great activities and good learning experiences for kids, but not necessarily aligned to this particular standard. So this is where, like I mentioned before, this is where it starts to get really complex and where the discussion comes from. So the facilitators and I have designed an activity or a task related to doing something like this for, that hopefully you're able to get to in the afternoon.